good morning everybody on behalf of uh, sri lanka medical association and association for disaster risk management professionals sri lanka i would like to welcome you all to this important uh, discussion for expert talk uh, platform of sri lanka medical association on preparedness for seasonal hazards in sri lanka uh, as you all know sri lanka has been subjected to different kinds of disasters uh, throughout her history and these disasters or crises have uh, increased in intensity and magnitude over the last two or three decades so it is important that uh, we prepare for these uh, disasters or crises beforehand and uh, plan for mitigation and response activities accordingly to start off the proceedings i would like to invite dr vinya ariratna president sri lanka medical association he will be enlightening you about the uh, objectives of this uh, expert talk platform of sri lanka medical association so over to you uh, good morning dr anand malava tantri president of association of disaster risk uh, management professionals uh, our resource persons today uh, dr shiromani jayawardena director weather forecasting and decision support of the meteorology department and uh, engineer spc sugeeshwara director of irrigation hydrology and disaster management of the irrigation department dr gamini jayathis sir acting director landslide research and risk management division of the nbro uh, mr chatura lienarachi acting director preparedness of the disaster management center dr jagat amar sekara consultant community physician community physician attached to the national dengue control unit secretary sri lanka medical association our representatives of the uh, navy and the air force who are involved in disaster management and all the other distinguished invitees and also all of you who are joining online today this expert talk on preparedness for seasonal hazards in sri lanka as we meet today we can see the weather changes and some of our resource persons also found it difficult to get here on time because of the uh, heavy rain and also resulting um, flash floods in the city so disasters have been a part of human kind for centuries uh, sri lanka has been relatively fortunate in the sense that we are not experiencing some of the worst severe uh, forms of natural disasters compared to other countries in the world but last 30 40 years we have also faced very major disasters both natural as well as human induced or what are we call what we call man made disasters sri lanka medical association is 187 years old it's the apex organization professional organization of doctors in sri lanka who work in all sectors Uh, from specialists to doctors who are working in the government sector the private sector non government sector uh, so uh, it's a very important uh, professional body that has to update the knowledge of our doctors and also uh, influence national policies and this year uh, under my presidency we have chosen the theme towards humane healthcare excellence equity and community when we say humane health care that we have to relate to the problems health issues that are uh, that that uh, affect our people of all communities in sri lanka and we have to not only give a uh, excellent uh, care in terms of quality of our medical services but also it has to follow certain ethical principles so that's what we mean by humane health care and also excellence is that we know that there are a lot of advances that are happening in the field of medicine in the field of public health and also uh, in any other field now disaster uh, preparedness disaster resilience disaster management all these fields have also become very very specialized that's why we now have a, even a professional association of disaster management experts so in our case we like to update our doctors with the latest knowledge on uh, public health issues health related issues clinical management and so on so that's what we mean, mean by having excellence uh, promoted as part of our work then equity we see lot of uh, disparities differences amongst different communities in sri lanka in terms of the health outcome it should not be the case because 
free health service is there for every citizen of Sri Lanka. So ideally we should not be seeing any differences in health outcomes of people, but we are experiencing that. So how can we as Sri Lanka Medical Association being the apex medical professional med medical body of uh, Sri, Sri Lanka uh, address these issues and we need to also influence policy. So that's what we mean by addressing equity. And then we have community. Of course, we have to relate to the citizens. We have to get community participation because no health challenge could be overcome just by just having experts or doctors or professionals like you addressing those problems. The community, the people have to be an integral part of decision making and they have to also play an important role, whether it is in disaster resilience or whether it is in control of uh, some of the major public health problems that we are facing now, the dengue or uh, leptospirosis or any other disease, the community has to be a part of it. That's why we have chosen this field, uh, this theme for this year. And it's a great pleasure for us to organize this series of expert lecture series, expert talks. It's one of the uh, uh, interventions that we are professional interventions that we are making we have other regional clinical meetings we have also uh, therapeutic updates so so many other uh, things are happening but this expert talks is also to promote multi-sectoral collaboration so we are very fortunate today uh, to be uh, uh, partnering with the disaster uh, risk management experts association and also, we are going to set up an expert committee on disaster resilience and management under the Sri Lanka Medical Association because we are experiencing these disasters more and more. So, uh, different sectors need to work together, particularly public health, medical and disaster resilience uh, building organizations and experts and also NBRO, the meteorological department and others need to work together. So, we are providing this platform. Uh, through this expert committee and SLMA expert committees can have representation from non-medical specialities also which are very important. So I invite you and we have from the tri forces here today and uh, we are very happy that you, your presence uh, is there today and uh, to conclude I would like to again welcome all our exp experts uh, who are going to be speaking to us today and also all of you who are attending uh, to listen to these presentations and be a part of SLMA and also those of you who are joining online, I hope you will gather some new knowledge, new information and be part of addressing natural uh, hazards in Sri Lanka, particularly we have to have preparedness for different types of hazards, what we call the multi-hazards preparedness. Thank you all for coming and uh, I wish you a, a very fruitful deliberation today. Thank you, sir. Thank you for enlightening us about the uh, thematic areas of uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association and the importance of uh, collaborating with stakeholders. Now we will move on to uh, another speaker. And this is a very important uh, uh, event in the uh, uh, history of uh, professional organizations in Sri Lanka. Now we have Sri Lanka Medical Association, the oldest medical association in Asia. And we have the newest pro professional association, that is the Association of uh, Disaster Risk Management Professionals, unique in its own because uh, such an uh, organization that is dedicated for disaster management professionals, uh, I think is nowhere found in uh, Southeast Asia. This is the uh, first such uh, professional organization for disaster management professionals. So to enlighten us about the uh, objectives of uh, this uh, Professional Association for Disaster Risk Management Professionals and the uh, functions of this uh, newly formed uh, ADRIMP or Association for Disaster Risk uh, Management Professionals. I would like to invite uh, eminent speaker, Dr. Anand Malavatantri, President of Sri Lanka, uh, Association for Disaster Risk Management Professionals, Sri Lanka. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Kodito Akko. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Vinay Ariratna, President of Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, and the two secretaries of the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the Association for Disaster Risk Management Professionals, uh, Dr. Sajit and Ms. Gautami. 
the distinguished speakers for today and ladies and gentlemen and those uh, are joining through the internet. A warm welcome to the proceedings today. So as Dr. Ariratna said, as Dr. Ariratna said, uh, is it better? Uh, we are very fortunate to uh, partner with the oldest association, probably Association for Disaster Risk Management Professionals is one of the youngest in Sri Lanka. So it's a it's a it's a win-win situation and also a very fortunate situation. Personally, I have worked with Dr. Ari Ratna, I don't know how many years, uh, because uh, when I was in UN, we used to send uh, our interns to uh, get the lessons from the senior Dr. Ari Ratna, our local sir. And then uh, that was how we baptized youth. We trained them in the induction and we take them to Saro there and uh, let them hear the wisdom. So likewise, we like to hear your wisdom right throughout that dream work uh, toward the betterment of the association because you are so young and we are looking forward. And uh, main, uh, how I, the, the, the evolution of the association was uh, probably goes back to tsunami days. Even before that, the landslides in Sri Lanka in 2003. I think uh, that's where the NBRO picked up this uh, modern day disaster management and then the tsunami. So along with these events, there were so many people got their capacities built up and honed in, in these uh, skills and then uh, started working with multiple sectors and multiple stakeholders. Uh, we had around, I think, about 100 people running around in Sri Lanka on disaster management at the very that level with the 25 district disaster management centers and the establishment of the disaster management center, emergency operations, the event database called Disinventor that we use that as a national database. All these things happened and then Along with that, there are a lot of professionals came out. Some are, some reach the PhD levels, some are in between, some work with international agencies like World Bank, Asian Development Bank and others. And some are still studying and they are now living around the, across the globe. So we saw the potential of bringing these uh, different expertise together in the form of this uh, Association for Disaster Risk Management Professionals. So that's that's the impetus uh, for the association. So it also brought in the senior colleagues like Mr. Sarath Premalal from the government side who had been working side by side with many agencies also to the picture and also the armed forces. A lot of colleagues who worked with us because initially the disaster management centers in the districts were run by armed forces. So all these and then uh, we had situations like the Manic Farm in Vaunia. We worked with uh, many agencies. So we saw this value, multi-stakeholder, multi-sector, as Dr. Ariratna mentioned, because this kind of areas, no one can do it alone. You need uh, this. Uh, so now we need activities. Now we need collaborations, because when you are young, you need partners. You can't just thrive yourself. And you need the international collaboration. So that's where we are, that phase. So we are trying to build up our networks, our strength, our resource base as well to do the work. So uh, that's the objective and the, uh, uh, how we think that the Disaster Management Association will work. And then come to the technical side. So that's where these uh, talks and the dissemination, we build, we see this as our association as a capacity building platform and a place where the professionals can join and hone their skills and work with communities and other professionals. So this expert series, now we are really happy to join hands with the Sri Lanka Medical Association. This is not the first time the we, uh, uh, at different capacities where we work with the medical association. So it's 
great to have that relationship renewed again. And then come to the topics. Uh, now we are today we are talking about the seasonal things. Now we had these simple things like the disaster calendar. Any given district, we have this simple calendar. When the flood comes, when the drought comes, when the landslide comes, when the dengue comes, when the other disasters come. So we could be prepared because we know in the calendar approximately where things are. But now the situation is has gone beyond that. We can't predict much. Now we, that means we have to do the preparedness more than earlier. Be it the known disasters like the floods, landslides, and the things like that. And also there are other disasters like the climate, climate change, the temperature changes. Now we see all kind of diseases we are feeling the heat wave now. So there things there are things changing. So we need new knowledge and new things. So the expert stocks are handy. So we are intending to bring these different uh, angles to the flow. Then we have another set of disasters that are unknown. Now, for example, the water pollution. Now, these days we are talking about the microplastics. How the microplastics attach to the other pollutants and get to the oceans and get to the fish and get into the food cycle. And also through the milk and many other channels. And also now, People are talking about microplastics going through skin. So now things are unknown. We go home with a headache. We don't know why. Maybe air quality, maybe some metals, mercury, okay. unknown things. So there are unknown disasters and the emerging disasters. So now we are in a real challenging situation to deal with the climate change, deal with the unknowns, deal with the knowns with the unpredictable uh, shifting. So I think in that regard, the association has to work with many others, with the all plethora of uh, professionals. And so, in, so we hope that uh, we could uh, contribute to the uh, global benefit as well as to the local benefit. So we again thank um, Association of Sri Lanka Medical Association for uh, giving us this opportunity to come and uh, get some of your exp uh, knowledge and how to run an institution. So this is a good exposure. So with that, uh, again, a good uh, uh, expert uh, session today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Anand. I think as uh, Dr. Anand mentioned, rightly mentioned, uh, disaster management is a subject that has uh, many facets. It includes meteorology, landslide mitigation, hydrology, then health. So we will be discussing these uh, different facets and the uh, importance of these uh, different facets uh, on preventing disasters as well as for preparedness of disasters. To start off the technical sessions, uh, I would like to invite our first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Shiromani Jayavardhana, who is the Director, Weather Forecasting and Decision Support Meteorology Department. She will be talking us about the overview on pre-monsoonal disturbances. Madam, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lahiru. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am going to talk about uh, about the overview about pre-monsoon disturbance uh, because uh, most of the extreme weather events are associated with these pre-monsoon disturbances. Uh, so let's talk about uh, pre-monsoon disturbances. So pre-monsoon disturbances are uh, low-level circulations that develops before the onset of monsoon. 
And uh, forty-eight percent of these uh, pre-monsoon disturbances in the North Indian Ocean, uh, usually located in the uh, Bay of Bengal, and thirty percent are in the Arabian Sea. Uh, so these uh, pre-monsoon disturbances are usually modulated by the uh, El Nino, uh, that that unusual warming of uh, and cooling of. Uh, in uh, Equatorial Pacific Ocean, then Indian Ocean Dipole, Madden Julian Oscillation, Equatorial uh, Rossby Waves, as well as Intertropical Convergence Zone. Uh, in Sri Lanka, these uh, pre monsoon disturbances have significant impact on extreme weather events, uh, especially. Uh, in 2003, 2016, 2017, 2018, most of this uh, hazardous uh, weather is associated with the pre-monsoon disturbances. So these are the pre-monsoon disturbances uh, that develop over uh, North Indian Ocean. So you can see uh, that uh, yellow color one are disturbances that are not developed further into a, a low pressure systems or depressions or cyclones. And uh, blue color ones are low pressure areas. Then uh, purple colors are depressions. And uh, yellow colors are deep depression. And red ones are uh, which develop further into cyclonic storms, severe cyclonic storms, and super cyclonic storms. So you can see if we consider over Sri Lanka, most of the pre monsoon disturbances are just disturbances, not developed further into uh, intense uh, cyclonic systems. But uh, we can see some low pressure areas as well as depressions also uh, do, uh, occurred over uh, Sri Lanka. So this also I got from a paper from uh, Mistra. Uh, and uh, it shows us uh, um, that pre-monsoon disturbances that develop uh, over North Indian Ocean. So you can see I highlighted in red that, uh, we, that we have significant impacts, especially 2003, we had that system developed from 10 to uh, 20th May. And uh, 2008, uh, end of April, April 28th to 2nd May, uh, then we have on 2010, we had one uh, tropical cyclone, Lila. Uh, which de developed over 17th to 21, 21st May. And then 2016, Ronu actually, Ronu developed uh, uh, on 17th May, but we experienced he extremely heavy falls before that. During the formation stage, uh, that 15th, 16th, and 17th, we experienced very really extremely heavy falls over Sri Lanka. And then the uh, second one is. Uh, Mora, cyclonic storm Mora, which developed over uh, Bay of Bengal on 28th to 31st May. Uh, and this system also, we experienced extremely heavy falls on 25th May before uh, this system, because here actually uh, we cannot uh, provide the exact locations unless it developed into well-organized structure. So after it intensified into a depression only, we can locate exact location of that system. So that's why uh, this uh, all uh, the uh, these systems has given uh, the uh, locations after it uh, developed into a further into a, a depression. Uh, so these are the tracks from 2000 to 2022. So you can see most of them, none of them are across Sri Lanka, but we experienced extremely ra heavy rainfall uh, uh, due to some of these systems. So let's talk one by one. This is the 2003 cyclone, uh, which uh, that time there was no name for uh, cyclones developed over the uh, Bay of Bengal or Arabian Sea, so just uh, we call it 2003 cyclone, uh, which developed over 10th to 19th May. And on 17th May, we experienced extremely heavy falls, about seven, more than 750 millimeter rainfall over the Nia area, and uh, which caused a uh, lot of damages. And then uh, uh, second one is 2008. There was another cyclone. Uh, we call this Nagi cyclone Nagis. Actually, we uh, landfall over the Myanmar. Uh, but we also experienced some heavy falls, especially over Attanagaluoya area. But same type of system developed in 2019 from to, uh, April 26th to uh, May uh, 3rd 
but that uh, system will not bring much rain over Sri Lanka because you can see we see with the feeder bands are located to the south of Sri Lanka, not across Sri Lanka. So uh, uh, if the cyclones are actually uh, the track is different, 2019 cyclonic fanny, it um, went directly to the uh, West Bengal, uh, but uh, the 2008 one uh, went uh, landfall over Myanmar area, but the locations are same. So it was uh, developed over Southwest Bay of uh, South Bay, Southwest though, Southeast Bay of Bengal, uh, but 2008 one, bring heavy rain, but 2019 one uh, was not, no, no heavy rain over Sri Lanka. Then there was another cyclone, 2010, uh, developed over uh, Bay of Bengal on uh, May 17th to 20th. We call it Cyclone Laila. That also bring heavy rain for lower coastal regions, not interior parts of the country like uh, but only coastal regions. So you can see May 17th and May 18th, we experienced heavy rainfall. So values are here. And uh, and this, uh, if I consider the different level, how the circulation pattern uh, develop over different levels of the atmosphere, you can see, especially uh, it was tilted. So it coming from low level to upper levels. Uh, so you can see the center is tilted towards Sri Lanka. And then there was another cyclonic storm, Cyclone Viru, uh, which developed from 10 to 17th uh, May uh, 2013. The, that system also brought heavy rainfall over uh, western slopes of the central hills. You can see on 13th uh, May, uh, that uh, canyon experienced around 410, nearly 409 millimeter rainfall. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure whether we have any uh, uh, disasters associated with that. Uh, but this is very uh, famous one, uh, 2016, the cyclonic storm Ronu. Uh, it develops uh, to the north of Sri Lanka from 17th, uh, uh, it developed uh, into a depression and it crossed uh, Bangladesh. Uh, but on 15th, 16th and 17th, we experienced extremely heavy rainfall. Uh, that is a duration during the formation of genesis of that system. So it's very difficult to uh, identify the locations. So we experience heavy rainfall over uh, Kegol districts as well as northern part of the country. You can see that the circulation pattern as low level is over Sri Lanka, uh, but uh, it was developed into a, a depression once it moved away from Sri Lanka. Uh, then 2017 May, it's also same, uh, this system called Cyclone Mora, which develops on 7, uh, 27 to, uh, 27th, uh, it developed into a depression uh, and it landfall on 31st. But uh, this system also extremely heavy rainfall, about 643 millimeter rainfall within 24 hours occurred on 25th. That time it was just the disturbance or low pressure area not developed because it developed into a depression on 27th. Uh, then 2008 actually you can see there was a cyclonic storm uh, to the uh, north of Sri Lanka but this system not, de not further developed into a depression uh, but uh, we experienced heavy falls over uh, western parts of the country. And then 2020, we had a severe cyclonic storm, Amphan, which also brought heavy rainfall on 15th. And uh, this system uh, brought during the formation stage, uh, it ex we experienced heavy rainfall over Kegol, uh, Gol, and Colombo area. And once it developed into a, a super cyclonic storm, uh, on 18th and 19th, we experienced heavy falls over western slopes of the central hills. Uh, then 2021, there was a two uh, cyclones, one developed over uh, Arabian Sea on uh, 14th to 19th, and second one, uh, tropical cyclone, yes, uh, that was from 23rd to 26th. So during the formation, usually when there was a cyclone developed in the Arabian Sea, we experienced very less, less rainfall. But this system developed uh, very closer to Sri Lanka. 
So during the developing stage, uh, it ex we experienced more than 300 millimeter rainfall over the uh, this uh, western and southern part of the country. And then the cyclone Yas developed after uh, 23rd uh, May, uh, and that was developed actually in the uh, northern, uh, the central bay of Bengal, but we experienced extremely strong winds, uh, very strong winds we experienced uh, during this uh, uh, cyclonic gas, and we experienced heavy falls over western slopes of the central hills. And then uh, 2022, uh, cyclone Asani developed from uh, uh, 7 to 12, so we experienced heavy falls over western slopes of the central hills on 10th, 11th, and 12th. So this year, right now, the Madden Julian oscillation, so I, I forgot to mention, so when we have extremely heavy falls, Madden Julian oscillation, Madden Julian oscillation is a system that developed over the uh, West Indian Ocean and moves uh, uh, along the equator. And when it was in the phase, uh, it has uh, different phases based on its location. Uh, when it's uh, over Indian Ocean, we call phase two, three, and then it will go to the uh, this uh, Western Pacific during phase four, five, uh, and then six, seven, Central Pacific, and then. Uh, it, the convection part will dissipate, but the uh, uh, that circulation part will move across the world. So this uh, Madden Julian oscillation was uh, when it's strong and was uh, uh, located over Sri Lanka, we experienced heavy falls. So uh, usually that according to that uh, this uh, the, the down one is the what is the present status of the. Uh, Madden Julian oscillation and its prediction. It was actually over uh, um, Sri Lankan area during last couple of days. That's why we experienced heavy falls. And now it's moving to uh, phase four and uh, it is expected to move uh, phase five in uh, next uh, five days. So uh, there is a possibility formation of pre-monsoon disturbance around 10th May. Uh, so you can see the possible locations uh, depicted in red color and it uh, that according to the present status it looked like to move towards Myanmar or Bangladesh but during the formation stage maybe before 10th we make extremely heavy falls uh, we need to uh, monitor this very carefully and uh, we will inform the uh, our sectors uh, if it's further developed into extreme uh, it will uh, likely to develop some extreme rainfall over Sri Lanka. So in summary, uh, pre monsoons developed over Bay of Bengal have significant impact on rainfall over southwestern part. Uh, some years, uh, this pre-monsoon uh, disturbance extremely uh, heavy falls leading into uh, flooding and landslides. Uh, some, uh, especially during the formation stage, we experience uh, Heavy falls uh, favored by strong MGO in phase two, three, like 2016, 2017, and 2018. Then, once this pre monsoon disturbance uh, further intensified in tropical cyclones, there can be extremely heavy fall in the remote areas. So, that's what we experienced in 2003, uh, 2013, 2020, and 2022. Uh, so, we have to uh, uh, monitor both with, during the formation stage as well as one if the system further develop into a tropical cyclone, if the field bands are likely to uh, uh, pass over Sri Lanka, then we have to be uh, vigilant regarding this. Uh, these are my references and thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Uh, thank you for updating about the uh, current weather status as well as the uh, climatic variations across uh, the island as well as in the region. I think many will be having questions about the uh, current weather status. Uh, we, we will have a separate session for questions and answers. So we will uh, move on to the uh, second speaker. Our second speaker is uh, 
engineer SPC Sugishwara, who is the uh, director irrigation, hydrology and disaster management from the irrigation department. So he will be uh, updating us on flood hazards and its prediction during the pre-monsoonal season. So over to you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me uh, to uh, share a few thoughts of uh, flood hazards during the uh, pre monsoonal disturbances uh, before the southwest monsoon. Uh, actually, I have prepared a few si slides uh, because of the time restrictions. Uh, uh, we need to limit, uh, I was instructed to limit the talk to 10 minutes. Uh, therefore, I have mm, selected uh, uh, mainly uh, in uh, three su subtopics. Uh, first, I will be briefing about uh, present hydrometeorological monitoring systems of Sri Lanka uh, because uh, the monitoring of uh, these uh, type of hazards uh, are very, very important for uh, early warning and predictions, uh, what is happening uh, uh, in addition to the meteorological pet predictions. Uh, what is really happening in the ground uh, has to be uh, properly and intensively monitored. Uh, therefore, uh, Irrigation Department has established uh, some monitoring networks. Uh, I will be talking about uh, these monitoring networks. Then, uh, then yeah, you know, uh, I will be uh, talking about uh, present practices of flood uh, forecasting and early warning. Uh, and then uh, I will uh, be be from you. Uh, what are the um, mainly uh, flood prone areas do you see during this season? Uh, based on the historical uh, the data, based on the historical data. Then, uh, uh, as I said, uh, when you say hydrometeorology, uh, the main, uh, main uh, uh, things are river water level, river discharge, rainfall. Without monitoring these kind of things, uh, uh, you know, it is uh, rather difficult to uh, investigate what is uh, happening in the uh, ground. Now, uh, the left side uh, map, uh, you can see the locations of uh, monitoring stations we have established. Uh, there are many monitoring uh, stations. You may be uh, wondering why uh, such a, a big uh, network uh, actually, uh, Sri Lanka is a kind of a very special uh, country uh, with regards to the river networks. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka is the uh, most dense, uh, the country who, which is having most dense uh, river network in the world, actually. Uh, when you uh, travel through the country, uh, you see, uh, you pass bridges uh, even within just 10 minutes. But uh, in India, if you travel, sometimes uh, for hours you may not meet a uh, bridge. Uh, therefore, uh, closely and densely monitoring is also required. Actually, present system is not uh, enough for the 
country for monitoring uh, river situation. Uh, we, are, we have planned to expand. Uh, however, I will be uh, briefing uh, now uh, first uh, there are many, many uh, few few systems to monitor the river le water level situation and the uh, rainfall situation. In addition to the Med Department and NBRO, Irrigation Department also monitoring rainfall of the country. Now uh, you can see this uh, 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 this picture. This is a kind of a river monitoring station, uh, manual monitoring station. Uh, a manual monitoring station, uh, they, these type of manual stations, there are around uh, 42 stations around the country. Uh, people are manned uh, on 24-7 ba uh, basis in these uh, locations. Each and every hour, manually, the river water levels are monitored. And in addition to the river water level, these locations, uh, they monitor manually the rainfall. Uh, you may be worrying now, uh, the, the technology has advanced so uh, rapidly, but still we are maintaining manual systems. But this is essential because uh, you know the technology can fail anytime. Uh, therefore, as a backup, these manual monitoring systems we don't abolish because, especially we, during the high uh, hazards, high, high events, high uh, meteorological events, there, there is a high possibility of. Uh, breaking down all these uh, uh, network systems. Uh, therefore, we don't abolish, but actually we are expanding uh, the manual monitoring uh, systems also. Uh, two years before we have only 35, now we have 42 stations. And uh, this in these stations, uh, these kind of river gauges or this type of bridge gauges are available. We are monitoring uh, this location. You, you see this, uh, uh, green color, I'm sorry, it's not very clear. Green color squares representing these manual monitoring stations. And then we have uh, something called, uh, uh, what you call uh, HMIS, Hydro Meteorological Monitoring System, developed in 2000, around 2014 to 2017. We call it uh, HMIS, uh, Hydro Meteorological Monitoring Systems, developed under the World Bank funds. Uh, we have 106 uh, stations, uh, automated stations, but unfortunately, these, uh, these uh, monitoring uh, network are limited to government uh, institutions. Uh, we have shared with uh, met, met, uh, DMC and uh, government with government organizations, but the system does not have the capacity to share with the public. So we are planning to develop it to a public network because uh, the, the, the public knowledge about the river situation and the rainfall situation is very, very essential so that they can they themselves take decisions. And uh, this type of uh, automated instruments have been installed under such uh, uh, systems. You see, uh, the, we call it bridge uh, automated gate. gauge. Uh, we have installed a, a kind of a laser device to monitor the river water level. Uh, and this type of automated rain gauges are also uh, 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 installed. Uh, uh, then, uh, uh, then uh, we have one one other network called uh, Rivernet. Rivernet has been is, uh, developed by uh, for the flood monitoring in Ratnapura city by uh, NG, uh, get with support of some NGOs. Uh, we have developed this Rivernet uh, uh, system to monitor uh, Ratnapura river water situation and above Ratnapura what is happening. Uh, then uh, this system is very, very uh, popular now among uh, people of Ratnapura. They are, uh, they are, the, they are now they are taking themselves decisions whether, whether the, our areas will be going under flood within next few hours or so. No, so uh, they can take, they are now improved to take decision on themselves without uh, expecting uh, some warnings from, from government institutions. And uh, uh, in addition, we have one something called Vaugam under the the the, the system, 
this has been developed under Vaugam Pubudua project, which is uh, managed by the UNDP. Uh, and uh, the, uh, these type of river gauges are uh, installed. Uh, when I say river gauges, always it accompanied with the rain gauge. And uh, uh, this our manual system, 42 stations, we have developed a semi-automated network. Uh, we have kept mobile phones with them. Using the mobile phone, they, the phones, they update hourly the water level situation, actually. Uh, all these real-time situation is updated within uh, five minutes. Uh, if you go to the irrigation department website, uh, www.irrigation.gov.lk, uh, there is a, when you scroll down, there is a button called real-time water level in major rivers. If, when you click, uh, this type of web page is uh, uh, browsed. The, and then you can monitor what is the uh, each and every station situation. In addition, the, there is an alert portal. Uh, what are the alert level stations? What are the stations at the minor flood level? What are the stations at the major flood level? Are also shown in the uh, in the front page of this web portal. This is GIS based web portal. Now it is uh, open for anybody. Uh, some of the uh, people are now uh, uh, the people who are uh, prone to floods are now uh, 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 gradually uh, uh, using these uh, platforms. Uh, then uh, uh, I will be uh, talking about the 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 present. What is the present uh, practices? What are the present practices of flood warning? Now, actually, uh, earlier flood warning was uh, purely based on. Uh, I'm sorry, this text are not displayed in in this machine. Maybe because of this uh, the fonts issue, uh, these are uh, mainly uh, single fonts, and we are issuing the messages uh, in three languages, uh, uh, separate pages. Uh, now. Uh, uh, we have we are first issue flood warnings based on the MET warnings. Now MET department is now uh, improved their systems to warn uh, ten day forecast and three day forecast like that. Uh, I, I, Dr. Shiromani, they are conducting uh, sessions uh, to warn uh, government institution and stakeholders about the upcoming uh, high winds. Uh, based on their their uh, uh, met warnings, uh, accompanied with the uh, ground situation. Now, uh, now we analyze their sit their warning with the ground situation. When I say ground situation, what is the current uh, situation of the rivers? What are the, what is the situation of upstream reservoirs? Are they f uh, full or are they about to spill? Uh, what is the situation of the uh, the saturation level of the soil? You know the 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 if the catchment is saturated, uh, then the uh, outflow from the rainfall events are higher, getting much higher. It's a, it has a big uh, effect on river flows. Therefore, uh, the ground saturation and the uh, current uh, water level of the rivers and the uh, and the upstream reservoir situations are uh, the key to uh, occurring floods, for occurring floods. Now, if the, uh, now suppose uh, if the dry, in a, in a kind of a dry situation, if uh, uh, daily rainfall of 200 millimeters is sometimes nothing, nothing will uh, be the result. But if the, uh, re, if the if, uh, rainfall is continued for days and suddenly it uh, become higher and uh, we get around 200 or 250 millimeter rainfall, then there is a possibility of uh, occurring floods. Actually, we are using uh, not only the manual uh, experiences, but also uh, this thing called flood models. We have developed uh, some flood models for these river basins. In Sri Lanka, you, have, you know, there are 103 river basins. But anyway, we have identified 25 river basins are vulnerable for floods. 
not all other, no, all the river basins. When you say 25 river basins, don't uh, mislead. It's not the 25%. Uh, uh, it's uh, the, the land area covered by these 25 river basins are almost two-thirds of the country. All other uh, small river basins, other size small river basins, but uh, you know in Sri Lanka, there are, uh, the, when I say, uh, then you now for example, uh, Jaffna Peninsula, we don't have any river. It's not covered by any river, but still there are floods. There are floods in Jaffna Peninsula. Uh, likewise, uh, in Sri Lanka, the many areas are prone to floods, but uh, vulnerable floods, we, when we select vulnerable floods, uh, deadly floods, there are, it's 25 river basins are vulnerable, starting from Kalu River. Kalu River is take the uh, number one, and then Kalni River, likewise, uh, there are uh, rivers. Now, uh, now when uh, uh, Med Department issue a warning, suppose uh, they issue a warning within next three days, after the third day, you will be having a uh, kind of a uh, high rainfall event. It, uh, there will be a, about 2,000 millimeters of daily rainfall. Uh, then based on that uh, information, actually they issue the warning with the maps uh, of uh, high rainfall areas. Then we uh, uh, analyze what are the river basins to be vulnerable with this, uh, with this warning. And then we uh, analyze the uh, this current situation of uh, the uh, uh, river basins, the, uh, as I said. Uh, saturation, upstream uh, reservoir situation, and the uh, and the uh, and the uh, what you call uh, uh, river water level situation. Now, suppose for example, now Kalni River Basin, there are two major reservoirs upstream, Mausagali and Kasalri. Now they are only filled up to twenty percent uh, today. Uh, so now, suppose uh, you get four hundred millimeters of rainfall above. Kasalri and Mausagale, uh, nothing will be come down because all the all the waters will be stored in Mausagale and Kasalri. Mausagale is a big reservoir; it's uh, eighty-five thousand acre feet, and Kasalri is uh, thirty-seven thousand acre feet. There are enough space now for storing water there, so you don't have to worry about. Now, suppose uh, if you observe uh, four hundred millimeters of rainfall at Canyon, don't worry much, but uh, but but still, uh, the rainfall below these two reservoirs are also enough for generating floods. That also has, has not to be uh, forgotten. Uh, therefore, the 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 closely monitoring of this uh, ground situation is very very important for issuing flood warning. Then, based on this uh, kind of issue, uh, situation, we issue this kind of a flood warning message. Uh, we call it pre-flood warning. Okay, these these river basins will be flooded uh, within next uh, three four days based on the Met forecast. Then uh, this is a kind of alert. Suppose, for example, in 2021, we alerted for seven river basins. Uh, actually, after three days, three out of that seven uh, river basins uh, were flooded. Uh, then this is a good kind of alert especially for disaster management authorities for and tri forces for arranging their uh, activities they they are they are the they are playing critical role actually our role is to uh, the support them with giving this technical uh, information and after issuing this kind of uh, river uh, uh, flood warning message we Irrigation department, actually we are not operating, uh, our head office is not operating 24-7 basis, but after issuing this kind of a message, we start 24-7 operation, uh, occupying our uh, people and uh, monitoring uh, the, the, the situation closely. And running flood models, uh, there are technical staff uh, who are capable of running flood, flood models, developing flood models. They are doing their job and they issue uh, alerts and this is the uh, generally the current flood warning practices but this this system has to be uh, improved 
with the uh, technical knowledge uh, and numerous technical knowledge now we are uh, we are working towards that direction uh, now you know there is a project called Chris MPA uh, uh, funded by the World Bank that project has just started now we are working with the project for getting the funds for improving uh, these systems further uh, and uh, these are the type of uh, uh, the flood warning messages uh, based on the observations. Now, after uh, after issuing free flood warning, we closely monitor and we monitor the uh, real time rainfall and the real time upstream or reserve, uh, river situations and issue warning for downstream uh, kind of exact warnings. Uh, sometimes for Kelne River, there is a chance of uh, warning floods uh, before uh, maybe 16 hours exactly uh, but it depends sometimes if you if the rainfall is at the downstream there is a the time gap is very limited because uh, if the Colombo is uh, uh, the Colombo is having a kind of a 500 millimeters of rainfall then uh, it's very difficult to uh, issue flood warnings in advance and uh, these are the actually areas according to the historical observations these are the areas uh, on the highest flood uh, threats during uh, this uh, uh, this pre monsoonal disturbances and the during the monsoon period also uh, you know i have listed this river basins from starting from kalawe uh, and we uh, actually we have developed uh, flood uh, prone areas of these river basins anybody who is like to take uh, these maps uh, we can issue uh, and these uh, these kalawe then daduruoya mahaoya attanagaloya kelniga kalwa these are not actually the uh, Priority. I mean, the highest vulnerable basis. It's not the. It's not that order. This is just upstream to downstream. Kalawe, Dadroye, Mahawe, Attanagaloye, Kelniga, Kaluga, Ginga, Nilola, Ganga. And uh, these are the. You know these uh, these uh, areas. But uh, when you say Maha Mahavali River, it's in the other side. But still, this period because of the. Candy area is the catch, uh, upper catchment of Maha Valley. This, this monsoon and rainfall is uh, affecting Candy and Norelia districts. So Maha Valley River also upstream gets sometimes higher rainfall in this uh, period. Therefore, there is a chance of uh, flooding in Maha Valley River uh, in this uh, river basin. In addition, these small river basins I have not shown because our system is not expanded to these river basins. Bentaraganga, Kiramoya, and Urubukoya, there are higher, uh, there are instances uh, which uh, higher floods have been occurred. Therefore, these river basins, actually, we are not monitoring these river basins. We, are plan we have planned to expand our systems into, into these river basins, but we still we have sometimes disastrous floods in these. Bentaraganga, uh, Kiramoya, and Urubukoya also. That is what uh, I want to share with you. And uh, if you have questions, uh, we can discuss during the discussion time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for reiterating the importance of uh, using both traditional and innovative methods for uh, flood warnings, as well as uh, communicating the uh, message to the uh, communities at the grassroots level. Thank you, sir, for that uh, informative session. Uh, next, we will move on to our next speaker, who will be joining online. Uh, Dr. Gamini Jayati, sir, who is the Acting Director, Landslide Research and Risk Management Division of National Building Research Organization. He will be updating us on the landslide hazards and its prediction during the monsoonal season. He will be joining us online. So, hope you can hear us. Uh, thank you very much. So, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. You can uh, share your presentation as well. Yeah, we can see your so presentation. I, uh, yes. already shared it and... Can you see it? 
Yes, sir. Better if you can okay. uh, put it into the uh, present mode. Uh, it's in the present mode in my. Is it not still in the present mode? Uh, no, sir, not yet. Okay. I think then. Yeah. Have you shared the screen, sir? First, you have to share the screen, then the presentation. Yeah, yeah, I have shared the screen. Wait, I will start from the beginning. How about now? Yes, we can now see, yeah. We can hear you and see you, sir. You can continue. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much and good morning. Uh, so since we have a very limited time, 10 minutes actually, I have prepared a very small presentation to give brief idea about uh, lands rights. So uh, my mandate is uh, managing lands rights risk in Sri Lanka. So prepared us for seasonal hazards in Sri Lanka. However, so my topic is lands rights. And first, uh, uh, I would like to give you some a brief idea about lands rights. And lands right is uh, part of uh, uh, denudation process. The denudation process means actually uh, this is an erosional process. So lands rights are a part of erosional process. So that is a, a natural process in the earth's surface. And when it comes to Sri Lanka, so we have <clears throat> large scale lands rights. And also small scale land sites, also we call it slope failures and cutting failures. Uh, uh, that's happened mainly behind houses and also the road cuttings and also subsidence. So both of the above two are considered as land sites and other things are not land site, but it still it records a uh, huge damage, especially the cutting failures. Uh, when it comes to land site, actually land site is not like, you know, it's not a recurring event like floods. Hmm? And it happens for the everywhere. Uh, it does not happen in the same place like flood. Uh, time to time, the, the spatial distribution of landslide is very random and hence it's very difficult to predict. Um, when we try to predict the landslide, that's really so we consider like uh, primary causes and triggering events. The primary causes mean actually the, the causes or the factors associated with the terrain. And the triggering events are some kind of, uh, you know, various kind of external factors coming from outside. And combination of both makes the uh, slope susceptible to failure. The terrain factors combine to make the slope susceptible and the trigger finally initiates the failure. So that's how it happens. So I would like to show you some terrain factors. The terrain factors mean actually some factors associated with the terrain. For example, slope angle, slope slate, uh, soil type, and things like that. And the triggering events, when we consider triggering events, the major triggering event in the world is rainfall. 63% uh, of the world landslides are triggered by rainfall. And the remaining uh, majority is triggered by uh, vibrations, so vibration mainly by earthquakes. Uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, initially, actually, 20% of land was considered as land site prone. Now, up, uh, today, it's increased up to 30%. Uh, initially, it was a seven districts, but now 14 major districts are prone to land sites. And initially, it was about 30% of the population, but it reached to 38% of the population now. And this is some of the land site recorded in Sri Lanka in different parts, mainly it's the Central Highlands. And these are districts uh, named in 1990, seven districts. And then 2003, another three districts came into the list. And then 2012, uh, even Purunagala, Monragala, Gampa, Kalambu, part of the districts were also included into this one. And this is mainly because of the human interactions. And this is the landslide hazard zonation map that we prepared for the um, country. 
So I will show you some of the important landslide events to get the gravity, the, get the idea of the gravity of that one. So these are some of the landslide in 2014 in Badula district. And you may know this one, the coastal and the media about the landslide, very famous one. And this is Aranaika landslide, which kills about 120 people in one place with a huge economic loss in 2016. And these are some of the, uh, uh, the the most recent and catastrophic event in 2017. And after that, uh, there were no major event until now, and we are expecting it soon, because every five, six years, so we get such kind of uh, uh, catastrophic events. And these are some of that uh, pictures happen in different parts of the country. Uh, when it comes to this uh, <clears throat> uh, rainfall pattern, actually, so mainly the Med Department forecast about the southwest monsoon and also the uh, uh, northeast monsoon. So those are the major uh, rainfall events that we experience. So this map shows you this red line shows you the southwest monsoon affected areas. Uh, by naming all these districts and areas, so you can see almost this, all 14 districts are prone to lands right during southwest monsoon, which is coming soon. And then we have the northeast monsoon. Uh, so within this northeast monsoon, you can see on the map that uh, red lines, and that's uh, Badulla, Monragala, Nuvarelia, Matale, Kurunagala, Kandy, Kegola, and Ratnapur. Part of those districts are affected by northeast monsoon. So this is... Uh, a uh, little bit special that I would like to talk a little bit about this one. And I hope that this justifies this uh, Dr. Shiromi's idea also, pre-monsoon disturbances. So we have a lot of confusion uh, with these uh, events, actually whether these are monsoon or pre-monsoon disturbances. So showing that one, actually I have put the dates occurred with this one. The first uh, uh, one I could find was 1984, it's uh, 22nd May. And then there's another event in 1996, 1st of January. And 1989, there's 16 to 18 May event, which caused the huge damages. And then again, 8th October and 16 September and 18 October. And then the major event, Dr. Shiromi also talked about this one, 2003, 17th May. And then there's a small event in 2012, landslide event, uh, uh, which killed uh, about 50 people, and it's 17 December. And again, we had 2014, 1st and 2nd June, and 29th October and 26th December. And then the next event is actually 16th and 17th May 2016. This is uh, with the Aranaika landslide. Uh, which killed about 120 people in one place, and also with many other landslides. And the next last one was 2017, 25th and 26th May. And from that, uh, 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021, or 2022, uh, we had uh, very small events, but not the major events. So that is what that we are expecting, another major event soon maybe this year or next year or maybe in 2025. And I feel a little bit like, uh, so matching with the Dr. Shiromi's uh, uh, discussion, I feel a little bit like these are uh, pre-monsoon disturbances events, mainly which occurred in May uh, around 15 to 25, okay. Uh, in Sri Lanka until 2022, uh, until now, we have counted like more than 1,600 lives we lost, and also more than uh, 200,000 homeless. And also every year, not every year, but time to time, we record uh, huge economic and human losses. Uh, this is mainly, I have to mention that, so we are not a country, you know, people are settled with the land use planning uh, system. So our people live everywhere. So we have to find some solution to manage uh, this kind of settlement patterns. And really, this is a very difficult task. Uh, when it comes to the NBR readiness, so I would like to talk a little bit about that one. And we have already prepared landslide hazard zonation maps to identify the spatial distribution of potential landslide. 
And also we have identified all these uh, high risk families and we have dominated uh, all these things. And so the second attempt is that second attempt is that uh, we issue landslide early warning. So we have established uh, uh, 330 automated rain gauges around the landslide prone areas. And with the predictions of the med department, and so we, you know, we start measuring all these things regularly uh, using this one. And based on that automated rain gauge network data, and we issue early warning. So this is uh, one of the automated rain gauge we established. Uh, we issue early warnings. And these early warnings will be issued to disaster management center and the DMC will disseminate this one to the respective communities. So the communities have been already identified from landslide hazard zonation maps and also site-specific landslide investigation. From that actually, we have identified almost 15,000 high-risk families around the country. And then also we have formed some community-based uh, early warning group. This is a bottom-top approach. So we have formed them and we have, you know, uh, strengthened their capacities for self-evacuation. And other thing is that once an event or a potential event happened, so we actually, we have 10 district officers around the landslide prone districts. And so we keep them ready with all these facilities. And so once an event happened and with the information of district uh, uh, or divisional secretaries or a Brahmani Ladaris, and we do some kind of investigations to take decisions to protect the people. So these are our some of the readiness for any kind of events. And these are the maps I mentioned to identify the potential landslide area. And uh, these are the uh, early warning threshold limits uh, that we have defined. And with that actually, so we issue these warnings to the DMC and also we issue it to the media and any kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, necessary people. And at the same time, so we have prepared the app also. So once you download that app, so app will also be updated. And so you can locate uh, whether the early warnings are issued into your location. And uh, uh, this is the mechanism. So we have this automated rain gauge. And so in NBRO central location, uh, with using some models that we uh, use in the rain gauge network data, and we create these early warning messages and we issue it to the DMC. And then the DMC will disseminate it to the vulnerable communities. And this is uh, that kind of community-based approach. So you can see that it's a bottom-top approach and we have prepared these uh, community maps and community leaders and community groups so that they will have their rain gauges and they will measure the particular rainfall in the particular location. And so they will, uh, you know, they will uh, self-evacuate for the safety. And these are the uh, kind of field investigations. So uh, once we get uh, some kind of information from divisional or district secretaries, and we visit our scientists, visit the sites, and uh, immediately, so we, uh, you know, we recommend uh, the activities to be done for the safety of the people. And that's all, especially I want to mention that, you know, apart from the landslides, the cutting failures, because everywhere in uh, hilly terrain that uh, when you build a house, so you have a vertical cut behind your houses. And this, this is a major, you know, major uh, impact on uh, rural communities. So that for, we have to put uh, special attention on that matter. And, and we have tried a lot to educate this aspect separately. And um, or those are our attempts and readiness for uh, landslide risk management in the country for upcoming uh, monsoons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for uh, uh, giving us the uh, knowledge and uh, uh, very important information about the uh, preparedness of National Building Research Organization and its uh, regional partners. Uh, for a possible uh, landslides uh, during the monsoon season. Uh, so we will be uh, uh, 
discussing uh, during this session we we have been discussing about the uh, various natural hazards uh, flooding landslides etc now during the monsoon season also we have to be vigilant about uh, several diseases which has a seasonality pattern and which can cause immense burden to the health system of sri lanka as well as to the economy so to update us about the uh, preparedness of health sector uh, for disease outbreaks during the uh, monsoon in special reference to uh, dengue i would like to invite dr jagat tamarasekara consultant community physician national dengue control unit ministry of health uh, for the next talk so over to you thank you very much so i'll just uh, briefly uh, talk about the preparedness for seasonal hazards and uh, how we might get a dengue outbreaks we always tend to be uh, prepared and we tend to have outbreaks uh, during the uh, monsoonal periods so before that just uh, some key key facts about dengue uh, there are four zero types that's also important because um, current literature says that uh, when you get infected with uh, uh, one zero type uh, you uh, have the immunity throughout so Uh, the possibility is like four times you can get so that is also important when you uh, predict or when you get the outbreaks because if the uh, uh, sort of a some sort of zero type has not come out for a long time then the uh, the population is susceptible to that zero type so if that comes during outbreak then the spread also can be more and the two mosquitoes there is the edc egypt and albopictus both are the vectors for the the disease this um, Uh, vectors the one first one is the primary vector which is more effective than the second one the albopictus so uh, another issue is that uh, there are a lot of uh, infections globally and even sri lanka uh, and uh, some are uh, basically asymptomatic so that is also key issue when you look at it because they they can have the virus and then they can transmit while uh, staying at home so uh, that's about the the basic uh, disease situation and uh, now this is the, the dengue trends over the years uh, from 2001 to 2008 it was like less than 10000 cases per year so after 2009 outbreak where we got about 35000 it has been uh, 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 having that sort of um, uh, uh, rates for up to about 2016 when we had a big outbreak in 2017 where we had 186000 cases so this is a uh, this was a, a out, outbreak of big magnitude and 2019 also we had another outbreak uh, these two years 20 and 21 actually now if you look at it uh, not uh, not the next year we get outbreaks in one year two years gap so if you look at it after uh, 2019 these two years are very much low that is because we had the covid so covid we were staying at home so that that globally also literature articles say that dengue incidence decreased for two reasons one is uh, basically uh, when you don't go let's say you have the dengue but you don't go out then uh, you don't go to the school or the working place the virus doesn't go there so the people don't come there and then uh, the mosquitoes in that area can't take it so it it will be limited to your environment second thing when they were at home lot of people clean their gardens and kept it uh, clean also so uh, this is a general pattern globally also but after uh, the covid 19 outbreak now this last year we had 76000 cases and uh, 2023 up to now we are having 30000 so the alarming uh, the issue at the moment is that usually we have as as uh, we mentioned and the importance of this preparedness for monsoons we have two peaks which comes corresponding with the um uh, northeast monsoon and the southwest monsoon so those things uh, happen every year we have some sort of peak but the the important thing is in most years and actually uh, it comes to a baseline between the outbreaks but this year it never came to the Uh, baseline so it has been uh, at that level so if we get a outbreak on top of that it might be even having a bigger magnitude than the previous year so that is also uh, one aspect that we have to think of uh, so uh, 
now it is it can vary so just uh, example uh, that i have put uh, gampa district now see see the, the it has never come to the baseline it's at a higher level so this is just to give you information i can uh, like go on about the uh, i can go on about the uh, different districts but this is just example to say that when you are doing preparedness and all maybe at national level maybe at district or provincial level uh, even MOH level you have to see where it the high risk is and go for the high risk strategy so even during the preparedness and uh, even uh, during the monsoon so age group also is one area so I'll just keep it brief so this is also another area where the working population is about 60 percent and the school going is about 25 percent working population itself is a problem because when you have 65 percent or the 62 percent of the population uh, uh, getting the infection they are working population either they are at home or even the ladies or the gents they go for work so and they attend to their children so even with fever they won't go he health seeking behavior is very much less unless they have to go so they might come late so critical phase if you can't detect then that can uh, lead to complications so that is also another uh, place because if you have a small child at home if you are sick the tendency for the mother or the father to is take them to uh, see a doctor but when they get it they uh, really do that so that is also another issue so uh, this is just a summary of the dengue situation and uh, the, uh, the demographic and th those areas but what we can do for the preparedness just about another three four slides um, one thing is we have to strengthen the surveillance there are a few surveillances that we have to think of now this is a this is a model where the surveillance uh, is not detecting no action is taken so this is a natural way you have the uh, climate and the uh, uh, the changes in the rain patterns you get the water then you get the mosquito uh, density going up the amplifying and then you get the disease so this is the way it happens but if you strengthen this and if you are prepared here with the forecasting you can detect early so first area to detect is the entomological surveillance so that is the key so if you detect this area the mosquito population is increasing these are the containers where it's breeding these are the institutions where it's breeding then you can take action to reduce second thing is the disease so disease also you can check from the MOH level which area it's in increasing which GN divisions like that and take action immediately then you can prevent so this kind of a mountain like a burden can be reduced to this much if you have strengthened surveillance so uh, in addition to that uh, we do another thing to assess the hospital burden we do something called the midnight total right so that is I'll just if I can go back and yeah I can do that so this is like every day in the night from key hospitals about 75 hospitals in the country we check the burden of dengue patients in the night so that has two parameters one is the number of cases contribute to the midnight total second thing is the uh, duration of their stay let's say uh, 10 pa uh, patients come and they stay for two days maybe they will come for two days for the midnight total but if 10 patients come and they stay for five days they come for five days so every day that two parameters affect the midnight total so why do we uh, do that surveillance also that is also part of preparedness just to see whether the hospitals are getting overburdened with patients and to take action so uh, uh, that is the uh, issue and then we do a feedback and dissemination even uh, in our website we have the weekly dengue update so at, at each week uh, by um, Sunday we finish that uh, week and then by about uh, Tuesday evening we have it in the website so every week summary of the uh, the burden in the hospitals the districts the high MOH area everything is there even for the public to see so uh, this is about uh, different hospitals just to say so uh, another area that we have to think is uh, strengthening hospital uh, capacity and management as a prepared measure so last year we did uh, so many programs even january we did with slma also we did the clinical uh, programs where uh, we uh, um, train the staff 
private sector, public sector, uh, tri forces with the military academy. We had sessions, so we had so many things. We are not during the outbreak. Before the outbreak, we trained the staff in the hospitals, uh, logistics also uh, checked, and we have prepared it. Then another uh, some areas like I think last year we trained about about five hundred uh, staff. And uh, logistics also, uh, we have improved. So they have the HDU and the uh, the, the parameter, the the uh, uh, PCV machines and hematocrit machines. All those are there. Uh, two three areas now this year, especially Western Province. Two three areas that uh, we have uh, basically uh, two three areas we have basically. Um, uh, uh, done it but not yet implemented that is fever corner and referral system that means all, some hospitals will have a fever corner if there is so many patients coming with fever so they have kept a place and kept it ready but not activated because we don't need to do it second thing is referral system sometimes major hospitals if there is uh, too many patients they might might need another hospital a small hospital to transfer the patients to if there is a Situation. So those things are ready, but not uh, uh, not implemented because it's not yet uh, to a magnitude of a huge outbreak. But uh, another thing we have to understand is if now uh, if you go, I'll just go through this. I think I uh, didn't mention much about the case fatality rate. Now here it was like one percent. So if you have thirty five thousand cases, three hundred and fifty deaths. But with uh, this um, clinical management and the facilities and guidelines and all that, it's now like 0.1%. So if you have, uh, just imagine here if we had uh, 1%, it would have been 1,860 deaths. But because it's like 0.1%, but here it was 0.24, uh, it will be about 186 deaths. So, so that sort of thing we are maintaining now last year also up to now was 0 0.05 so not even 0.1 percent so but one thing we have to uh, acknowledge is if the outbreak continues too many patients come to the hospital system then we are going to have a problem with uh, the cases staff will be overburdened and uh, the logistics and then the case fatality also might uh, increase because uh, you had to detect the patients at the critical phase to take action, but that might not happen. So, preventing outbreak will prevent deaths also. So, that is also important in preparedness. Another thing is we did a special mosquito campaign. See, our statistics show that uh, mosquito, uh, uh, our, uh, um, the, the, when you look at the provinces, 50% of the cases are from one province, that is the western province. So we go for the high risk approach. So, so, so the actually the the provincial council, the governor and the uh, provincial director health services, they have to, they took the initiative with NDCO. We give the support, but uh, basically uh, when we are having the preparedness, another aspect is to take time and uh, clean up and make sure the the mosquito breeding places are eliminated before the monsoons. So then 50% is coming from Western province. So it was a high risk strategy where we targeted Western province. We had a one week uh, campaign where the PDHS, the governor, the, uh, the Western province, they took the initiative. So the, its ownership has to be them, then the MOH, their ownership. So MOH will tell, okay, decide which areas need this campaign. PHI with GN division, so that ownership is with that and with the uh, people and the commun community-based uh, organizations during this campaign, Sarvo and all, they uh, mobilized their, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the people, the volunteers as well as the police. So another key area is the in good intersectoral coordination. Now national level also we have, we have the uh, monsoon preparedness and then the DMC meetings. We have national level uh, involvement, but at the same time, uh, it has to be there for all levels community involvement as well as uh, the uh, intersectoral coordination. Now, uh, for this week, the Education Ministry of the Western Province they gave a special uh, sort of a guideline 17th, 18th, 19th of April. 
schools have to be clean before the students come. So uh, then the health ministry uh, with our, our collaboration, so the, uh, the PD, uh, PDHS level, they gave a letter to the MOH, please go to your schools, help out, even for disposal of garbage and those things also help out. So it has to be an intersectoral. This is not a, a health uh, sector alone can, can't do this. We can support in some area. So we are getting this good intersectoral collaboration at different levels. So another area that we have to uh, think of is the preparedness with uh, previous information. Now, uh, example is now uh, in the uh, earlier special mosquito control campaigns, if you look at it, now see, uh, rather than the houses, now the houses, basically premises with lava is 3%. But if you look at other education, government institutions, factories, public places, those are higher. So we had to go with that data and now even the Western province when they did two or three days they kept for the institutions and the schools and the factories and all because of two things. One is the, the positivity rate is high, the level because uh, not like a house, house they might keep it clean. Second thing is the yield is also high, whatever lava collection in houses we have seen it is uh, mostly small containers and all that few lava. But in these areas, sometimes construction sites, you get the slab. So whole area, lot of water with uh, large amount of lava. So considering all that have to be focused when you do the preparedness. Even type of, uh, type of uh, breeding sites also uh, have to be considered. For example, now these are like uh, water storage items, discarded items. Those are the items that national level we can pre uh, project. But MOH level, in at some place, the water storage might be higher level. For example, maybe in uh, Marvanel area and all that we have seen, even uh, those areas, uh, when you have limited water for a couple of hours, they store water. So their water uh, storage may be a bigger problem than the national figure. So you have to take and analyze uh, your situation and then do your preparedness and see where you are targeting for preventing dengue in your area. So uh, those are, in a nutshell, what uh, uh, preparedness means, not a very comprehensive, the, uh, covering everything about the communication and all that, but just to give a rough idea how we are guided. So uh, I think I'll stop now. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that excellent speech. Uh, now uh, we will open the floor for the discussion. So for the people who are joining online, uh, they are free to unmute your uh, Zoom session and you all can ask questions from the expert panel. Uh, to conduct the discussion, I would like to invite all the resource persons on stage so we can uh, continue the discussion. So I would like to invite all the resource persons on stage so the audience, they can ask questions as well as uh, the people who are joining online. So they also can uh, ask questions. Anand sir, why did you also join? Uh, feel free to use the chat option also uh, to send the questions. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for all the speakers for making a very 
comprehensive presentation. This is timely, very important. So my question is to Dr. Jayati, sir. So first, I would like to thank NBR for wonderful work to prepare for the land side. So Dr. Jayati, sir mentioned that they have identified the risk areas for land side and they have come up with the uh, plans for the risk identification and maps are available. So my question is, uh, rather than questions, so let's get an uh, understanding. Have you identified places for these people to uh, settle? So what are the plans for settling all these high-risk people? So that is very good, identifying the risk, but I believe it is equally important for them to provide some um, safer place and then only uh, the people are ready to move from these risk areas. Thank you. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for a very good question. I, I hope that you can hear me. Can hear, Doctor. Uh, okay, so the answer is yes. Actually, so we have identified 15,000 high-risk families and the, we have made a proposal and government approved it. Hmm? And to give them, uh, uh, you know, safe land plot, and also to 1.2 million rupees as then, you know, support to build their new house. Uh, from that approach, actually, we have already <coughs> resettled uh, more than 3,000 families, especially in Kegol. Actually, this program was initiated based on the 2016 landslide event in Kegol, and already we have resettled. And under that resettlement program, so we have some priorities actually. And based on the priority, we resettle these high risk families. Uh, of course, because of this uh, economic crisis, uh, there's a little bit drop of that one. And at the same time, the major problem, as you mentioned, was uh, uh, you know uh, finding suitable lands, which belongs to the government and especially in the estate sector. So the lands, uh, I don't know whether it is belongs to the government or uh, private companies, but it's a little bit lengthy process to get it and also to identify the government on land. Because of that, actually, we have proposed two approaches. So one is an owner-driven approach where the owner can find the land and claim for uh, uh, 400,000 rupees for the land and 1.2 million rupees for the for building the house. So now there's another problem with that approach also uh, saying that 1.2 million is not enough to build a house in, in these days because of the high uh, prices of the <coughs> items. And uh, so we are in the process of uh, proposing uh, uh, another uh, scheme also uh, but with this uh, economic crisis, so of course there are uh, problems. But anyway, there's a program for that one. And the other approach is also a uh, donor-driven approach. So under the donor-driven approach, actually in, in Kegel District, actually we have uh, built uh, about 2,000 houses with the support of Chinese government and some private companies and things like that. So that is the approach that we have proposed and in place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. If there are other questions, uh, now is the time we can uh, clarify the doubts. I think I, I will use one, uh, this one. Uh, thanks again. Uh, thanks for the whole panel. And my question is actually to Engineer Sugishwar, sitting right next to me. Um, I think you mentioned that you are monitoring the soil moisture. And now we have the soil moisture and we have the rainfall, we have the open reservoir capacity. So it's like, for me, it's like a story. So you have wet soil or dry soil or uh, empty reservoirs or filled reservoirs and then Rain above catchment of the reservoir and the below catchment of the reservoir, and then you have so many of those systems. Now, in the day that uh, you have the artificial intelligence and all the computing power, can how far we are telling the whole Sri Lankan story by minute? 
like the whole water budget uh, going up and down that because with the whole modeling capacity you have i know it yeah i am asking too much but i like to hear this uh, uh, fairy tale uh thank you uh, dr uh, anand uh, for uh, nice and very um, complex uh, question actually uh, and uh, actually uh, uh at present as i said during my presentation uh now we are monitoring the ground situation now for example we are monitoring the soil moisture by using satellite uh, techniques but uh those are not so uh to to it's not like uh, uh then some countries they uh, monitor soil moisture using uh, ground installed equipments but we don't have such a uh, complex system uh, now now uh, our monitoring uh, capacity is limited actually in that sense uh, now there are some some kind of uh, uh, there are free uh, satellite systems uh, to give us some some kind of insight about soil moisture not actually the real the real the ground situation now uh now we, when we are inputting uh, data into our models what we can uh, the, our, our capacity is limited in that sense it's not uh, it's not the uh, i i mean uh, when i when i do my presentation i did not uh, talk about that but there are still there are limitations still there are many areas our capacity has to be our instrumentation has to be improved uh uh now we we have uh, the the good thing is we have identified our the uh, our, our limitations and uh, the hopefully uh now our modeling our modeling outputs we don't trust actually 100% we have model outputs we are running models but uh, i you know, frankly i should say you uh we don't issue warnings the based on uh the purely based on those model outputs we always has to uh, keep the doubts because we know our data are not so uh, perfect the to be the the to be the, to output to be the best the input should be uh, best otherwise now now there is a there is a popular saying among these hydrologists uh the hydrological models are kind of uh, garbage in garbage out we call it garbage you you input garbage then you get garbage out but uh, to get uh, a reasonably accurate results your inputs must be uh perfect so uh, we are working towards that direction so actually uh, uh now best thing is now that there are good things and bad things in our institutions now now there are some people mm -hmm. with the latest knowledge but uh, running out of uh, uh provisions for implementing their ideas there are some people uh, who are just uh, wasting time in uh, the institutions uh, frankly uh they uh, though there are provisions are available they are they are not initiating th the things so we are struggling with that kind of situation in our st institutions but uh things are moving things are moving as uh, professor uh, dr anand malotron said things are moving in a, um, not in a very bad direction we are moving we are moving forward hopefully uh uh there is a there is a aim in the uh, world meteorological organization by 2030 uh, each of this uh, each one of the population has to be alerted beforehand about the uh, meteorological hydrometeorological situation i mean about the flood and droughts uh, by 2030 uh, 
the each uh, ma, 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 e, yeah, the population by the public has uh, should be uh, having the uh, that kind of alert now we are working uh, towards that direction thank you thank you very much very important informative and a uh, very good presentations and also thank you for the organizers uh, to organize such a good uh, discussion rightly very much important uh, my question is for dr jagat actually this is not a question as a general public we observing now that uh, compared to the before uh, covid pandemic the attention for the prevention of dengue is getting uh, in the lower level especially that uh, the engagement of the community engagement of the military engagement of the government officers home visits and all kind of uh, the prevention and awareness intervention is happening very low level and then i think uh, this is uh, uh, the right now that uh, the dengue is uh, regaining back and in its it's getting a disaster then what kind of strategies that uh, the government uh, upcoming strategies to uh, prevention and then the action for the dengue mitigation yeah, yeah thank thank you very much i think that's a very good question uh, very timely too as you said rightly the last couple of years due to the covid 19 um, uh, partially uh, because of the lockdown and the other aspects uh, that uh, not much concentration on dengue and uh, now like we are getting back to normal and we are now doing the normal activities the possibility of uh, getting outbreaks is very much there. So uh, there are certain systems in place, like um, from the, the, the intersectional coordination also, um, from the highest level, from the presidential task force uh, to the uh, provincial level coordinations, like that we ha had the system. So we are activating that again, a new uh, letter has been issued from the presidential. Uh, secretary level uh, and now the institutions are also coming into place so the institutions also will have to form their own committees uh, see keep the premises free of uh, dengue that sort of uh, intersectoral as well as uh, ownership so yeah, actually those activities are uh, little by little we are trying to establish again what uh, due to the couple of years that uh, it has uh, reduced so uh, community awareness and community mobilization also uh, another area that we have to do so uh, those things are uh, getting formed but we have some more to do thank you uh, can i ask a question go ahead please uh, yeah okay so uh, i am jadisha from nbro so my question is for uh, Mr. Premaral, former DG with department and uh, Dr. Shiromani. And um, actually, I have been having this uh, confusion about this pre-monsoon disturbances and uh, monsoon because always, uh, especially with landslide events, actually we get most of the landslide events with southwest monsoon. And everybody is talking about this like a southwest monsoon. Uh, but uh, as far as I heard about that, uh, those things are pre-monsoon events uh, generally for my understanding the monsoons are a little bit you know some kind of stable rainfall pattern but the disturbances are very abrupt and so it's very difficult to predict and very sudden events so i would like to get this uh, uh, clarified from you and also i feel that so if we are using southwest monsoon uh, or uh, pre-monsoon disturbances correctly and it would be an additional advantage for the mitigation activities and you know preparedness and all these things so that uh, i would like to get a very good clarification from both of you thank you okay thank you dr jayati sir so dr shiromani <coughs> is not here today i mean that uh, just after uh, the presentation he went to the office 
so I will explain uh, so what is free monsoonal disturbances. Actually, until uh, two, three years ago, uh, two, three years, uh, until uh, uh, maybe uh, three years back, so we did not uh, talk about the free monsoonal disturbances. We just called the monsoon uh, rain. But you know, uh, so we have four monsoon season, the uh, first intermonsoon, southwest, uh, second intermonsoon and northeast monsoon. The first intermonsoon, the two intermonsoonal seasons we get uh, afternoon thunder showers uh, with the conjunctural, conjunctural pattern. So from uh, May, I mean that uh, just after start May or oh, you know that the end of April, so we did not get such kind of uh, rainfall pattern. So usually we get you know that uh, uh, weather, weather uh, rainfall uh, with some disturbances. But 25th May actually we start, uh, the, the rain, southeast monsoon will start. So for the southeast monsoon, so there are some criteria. So the wind pattern should be uh, southwesterly until certain level of the atmosphere. Uh, so that kind of, uh, uh, I mean that criteria is there. And when we uh, declare the southwest monsoon, after one week uh, India declare their southwest monsoon. So it has to be uh, that very correct uh, while uh, so we uh, uh, declare the southeast monsoon so uh, 25th until 25th may so we get more rain i mean that due to uh, this, i mean that uh, low pressure area what uh, Shiro, dr shiromani said and in addition uh, the in, uh, intertropical convergence so actually he has not mentioned intertropical convergence on, so on so even yesterday we got uh, rainfall yesterday and today so we are getting rainfall uh, with the intertropical convergence zone. So intertropical convergence zone, uh, the low pressure areas and sometimes depressions and some low level disturbances. So we get, uh, I mean that uh, we get that kind of uh, systems uh, from uh, uh, May, I mean that uh, uh, end of April to May 20th to 25th. So that is why actually we just uh, named it as the pre monsoonal disturbance. So we have to add the pre monsoon, I mean, that pre monsoonal period for our, I mean, that uh, uh, jargon. Otherwise, you know that we just say, so we have four, four monsoon, southeast monsoon, northeast monsoon, uh, so, um, and two second, uh, two more, more intermonsoon season. That's why we are actually, we aim to, we are, we, we are going to highlight in from this. Uh, uh, session to uh, uh, just explaining you know that what is pre monsoonal disturbance i mean that maybe you know that from next uh, next year so the other uh, agencies like you know that irrigation and so your your agency nbro we just you just you know that mentioned this uh, period as in uh, pre monsoonal disturbance thank you uh, may i talk oh ah, yeah i'm sure yes sure yes, go Shiro, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, there are two types of disturbances, like uh, the uh, disturbance that develop before the monsoon season, which can be uh, intensified into a tropical cyclone. But after establishing monsoon, these uh, uh, systems cannot develop further into a tropical cyclone because there are... Uh, uh, high wind shear because uh, with the monsoon it, after slash establishing this monsoon over the uh, South Asian region, we, we experience very strong winds. With that, the possibility of, of, of uh, further development into a tropical cyclone is limited. And uh, uh, I think one clarification for Dr. Jayatis's one, like uh, if you remember last year in uh, August 1st to uh, uh, 4th, August, we experienced extremely heavy falls over western slopes of the central hills. That is monsoonal rain. That is due to strengthening of monsoonal flow over Sri Lanka. So the mountain regions get extremely heavy falls in the month of August. But the uh, uh, rainfall we are experiencing before the onset of uh, monsoon due to this type of disturbances because once this type of tropical cyclone develops, the southwesterly flow established over the region temporarily. But once it landfall over a certain area, 
uh, there will be uh, some dis disruption to that wind flow. So again, there can be easterly wind flow for uh, until the uh, monsoon flow fully established, uh, like to uh, establish monsoon flow fully over the South Asian region. It takes like uh, from uh, second week of May to uh, July because it has to go to the foothills of Himalaya. So. Uh, July 1st week, it goes to the foothills of Himalaya. So the onset is gradually happening. Usually in Sri Lanka, uh, this uh, we experience this uh, onset around 25th. But this year, uh, because like I mentioned in my presentation, so there is a possibility formation of some sort of pre-monsoon disturbance uh, from uh, uh, 8, uh, 10 to 12th uh, May. But after that, uh, there's a possibility to break that uh, monsoonal flow and again establish the easterly flow, flow because the models predict uh, the delay of the onset this time. Uh, I hope uh, my explanation is clear. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Siromani and uh, uh, Mr. Premalal. So I, I hope that uh, so we can uh, use that term actually in uh, future. Uh, and so we can, uh, you know, uh, we can clearly define that one in that field. Thank you. I think we have more question. Yeah, go ahead. Mike. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting us for this occasion. So, actually, I want to discuss some important thing, as well as uh, from three forces side and especially police, what we are doing in a disaster. In every disaster, we are the first responder. From as an air force, we are we have the reach. So, we are uh, responding to the location within minimum time. And we hold the location until the respective agencies come to that location, maybe garden parties, maybe medical uh, staff or else other assistant parties of the government. So I'm going every conference uh, for a disaster representing Air Force within last uh, one and a half year time. And I was actively participating for disaster maybe near like 15 years. Actively participating 10 years. Uh, from the rescue missions as well as other responding matters, disaster rescue matters. So we are discussing everything uh, in proper manner, and uh, also we are participating uh, the the things in appropriate manner. We have set format. Even the police is also doing a great job in every disaster in village, wise or else wherever it happened. So there should be a actual disaster management. Centre is doing a uh, remarkable job in this aspect, but I'm thinking, uh, is there another effective platform to get every agency into uh, one uh, room and discuss and do things in, you know, hand in hand and doing things effectively? So this actual dislike of seminar or else conferences is very much important for that enhancing our knowledge on that. We have the, uh, the, the past data, we are discussing everything because we are doing this job other than our primary job. So we also have interest to do these kind of things in future as well. So if you can, uh, you know, do like under enhancing uh, programs like this for our other agencies, tri forces as well as police and uh, even the, with the uh, assistance of the disaster center, that is better. And really appreciate this kind of things and inviting us for these occasions to discuss things matter and enhancing our knowledge. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, le there's uh, no one from the disaster management center, so let me respond to the question. Uh, it's not a question, actually, it's an encouragement to go to the next level. Um, in the recent, probably the last five, six years, this uh, interagency coordination, we have to admit, it was not the best. So I think what uh, you're highlighting is the 
platform to come together, discuss knowledge as well as cooperation. And also, when you do that, then the resource sharing automatically happens. Uh, we had that situation before, I believe uh, around 2010, 2012, that time there was a uh, disaster management center led uh, National Disaster Management Coordinating Committee. Uh, Wing Commander Damit Chandrasekhar was part of it at that time. And then uh, at that time Air Force was managing about, I think about three or four uh, districts. Can't remember yeah, exactly where had Rinkomali is one. So, uh, we had it. I think what we need is like disaster management association can work a little bit more with the disaster management center to get these uh, platforms uh, rolling again. Uh, I think there's a very good uh, suggestion and we will uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work with uh, Major General Susanta to uh, make it happen. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, adding into that, so thank you, Wing Commander, for raising that uh, point, and that is why, as the chairperson of the Disaster Resilience and Management uh, Expert Committee of SLMA, and uh, the Lahiru is the secretary of that, so we have formed that expert committee because we discussed it uh, in greater details and we identified it's a major need at the moment. So we formed this subcommittee and. Uh, we have uh, planned certain activities in line so because not only the medical people talk about this we are going to invite uh, the uh, to share your experience the army navy and their forces and the police we will give a platform for you all also to share your experience we will organize these type of expert talks and especially for you all to share your experience we can learn a lot from your experience also so uh, our expert committee we will meet uh, next week uh, for a short meeting we will invite you all and we will plan out the things the main uh, aspect of this subcommittee is to uh, community engagements and everything so we will uh, plan it out and while the government and the associations are doing their uh, jobs we will also facilitate with uh, everyone and uh, create a platform for medical as well as non-medical people to come into the same platform and uh, do something uh, for our general public in our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very encouraging. Let me add another two points that uh, we ran into. A, the association helped the DMC recently to do the next five-year plan. And in India, we uh, cited few things that are related to forces as well as the others. Uh, uh, one is this uh, GIS and remote sensing capacity the armed forces are having. Uh, capturing data as well as in data processing and monitoring. I think uh, that's one area the we can get a lot of help from the capacity which ha that uh, was built during the war, but now it's uh, available for us to use in the civilian work. And the other side was the uh, uh, enhancement of the first aid, search and rescue, and swimming capacity. Because that's, I mean, we hear people go on a trip and then one or two missing. Uh, it can't happen in Sri Lanka because uh, we have these tanks and the reservoirs and the oceans. Everybody should be able to get out of water somehow, not the Olympic swimming, but at least to get out of the harm's way. So I think these are the, some of the things that we could work as uh, risk reduction professionals. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I think uh, because of the time constraints, uh, we have to uh, conclude our session. Uh, thank you very much, the expert panel and also the audience, both uh, physical and online, for their uh, questions as well as for their recommendations and suggestions. Um, I would li like to invite uh, Dr. Sajit Edir Singh, uh, to present a token of appreciation uh, from the Sri Lanka Medical Association for the expert uh, panel today. Uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Shiromani Jayavadana, since she is uh, not present now, uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Prem Ranjit Premalal, former uh, Director General of Meteorology Department, to uh, take her appreciation letter.
Thank you very much, sir. And also, we have to mention that uh, the concept of this uh, expert talk and the collaboration between the SLMA and the Adrim was uh, initiated by uh, Mr. Premalal. Thank you, sir, for your ideas and also suggestions. Um, Engineer SPC Sugishwara. Thank you, sir. Dr. Jagat Amarasegar. Thank you very much, sir. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sajit Edir Singh, Secretary Sri Lanka Medical Association, to deliver a word of thanks. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Laheru. Uh, so I'm not going to take a lot of time. Uh, so I would like to thank as the Sri Lanka Medical Association uh, for all the resource people uh, who had uh, given their expert knowledge on uh, the disaster management and the uh, the seasonal hazards that uh, and updating the knowledge on our audience and as the SLMA uh, we have newly established an expert committee on disaster resilience and the management so as the chairperson of that committee and the secretary is Dr. Lahiru so we will be mainly uh, inviting medical as well as non-medical uh, uh, participants who are engaged in disaster management. So thank you very much, uh, the armed forces, the Army, Navy, and the Air Force for uh, coming here today by accepting our invitation uh, to participate in this expert talk. And we will have our normal routine discussions in next week. And the main concept of this uh, expert committee uh, is to develop the community engagements to educate the general public uh, and do the community resilience. So, community, uh, the general public enhancements, how to uh, make them engage. And also, uh, there are a lot to learn because this is a multidisciplinary activity. So, as SLMA, the expert uh, committee in disaster resilience and the management, we will be inviting the non medical as well as the other stakeholders like uh, the armed forces to share their experience in the past uh, activities uh, in this disaster management. As uh, Dr. Ananda said, uh, the data an analysis, the data management, there are a lot to learn. There are new innovations coming up in this disaster management. So we will help in this all these aspects. And uh, so we ultimately our target should be give something uh, to our general public in a disaster. So once again, as the Secretary of SLMA, I would like to thank uh, the, all the participants and uh, the people who have accepted our invitation and coming here to listen to our expert talk. And once again, I would like to thank our eminent speakers who have joined online as well as physically uh, to share their experience and uh, update our knowledge. Thank you very much.